Hello, this is the HNC Mechanical Manufacturing Exam uh, sample paper and we're going to attack the whole of question one. Uh, question one is quite a strange one because it's essentially four totally different topics in a single question, um, but we will do our best. So, throughout this entire paper we're going to apply some uh, basic principles, um, which is one, we're going to uh, state the variables in the question. Uh, two, draw a diagram. Three, no relevant formula. And uh, four, start the question. If we always follow this principle, then we will um, we'll pick up some marks in if we don't quite know what we're doing and it'll also help build your confidence. So let's bear that in mind for question one, which says a structure is to be underpinned by a number of wooden struts. The total load has um, is 1.2 meganewtons, that's a force, and each strut is 100 millimeters square. Now they're telling us that because there's an area. So I'm thinking force and area, yeah, that's stress, stress is forced by area. If the maximum allowable stress in the timber is seven megapascals, calculate the minimum number of struts required. So let's just draw a quick diagram of that situation. We have a some kind of structure. We've got an unknown number of wooden struts underneath. We know that there's going to be a force applied of 1.2 meganewtons. Now, I suggest that you don't write 1.2 meganewtons, you put it in a standard form, which would be 1.2 times 10 to the 6, and that's our force. So we've drawn our diagram, we're stating our variables. We know that the area of one given section is going to be 0 0.1 meters by 0.1. So any given strut, and we remember we don't know how many of these there are, but one strut um, is going to work out to uh, 0 0.1 times 0 0.1, which is 0 0.01 meters squared. Um, right then, so let's formally state our variables. So our force is 1.2 times 10 to the 6. Our maximum allowable stress is 7 megapascals, which is 7 times 10 to the 6. And the actual area to to allow the situation, we don't know because that's a function of how many uh, struts there are. So our area is an unknown value. So we state our formula. So force is equal to, uh, or rather, let's try again, stress is equal to force by area. So let us just quickly rearrange that so that we find the scenario. So I'm going to take area to the top. And then take the stress under here to the bottom. And this is just a quick reminder in case you've, you've forgotten how to rearrange a very basic formula. And we can plug in our values. So in this case, our area is going to be equal to the force. 1.2 times 10 to the 6. Divided by the stress, which is 7 times 10 to the 6. Plug that into a calculator. And we get an area of 0 0.171 meters squared. However, um, we are interested in not a single strut of this area, the strut specified. So we need to find out how many of these 0 0.01 meter squared struts will fit into that value. So if we just quickly have 0 0.171 meter squared, that's the, the area required to support the structure. And we're using struts, so we'll find out how many of these 0 0.01 meter struts go into it. Divide that in, and we get 17. 0.1 struts 
Now, to my knowledge, you can't buy 0.1 of a strut. So we have to round up to 18 struts. 17 wouldn't have been enough. We need 18, and that is our solution. So the trick with this is not to get suckered into thinking, hey, well, you, you should be spotting that stress is forced over area, but just don't get suckered in by trying to plug the area directly into this. You're trying to work out the area required to support the structure and then divide that up by how many struts there are. So that's question 1A. So on to question 1B. And before we get into that, I'm just going to quickly run through a quick principle that we've used in the past. If we have a force acting in a given direction, let's suppose this is 10 newtons acting at an angle of 30 degrees then this force, even though it's pulling in a diagonal manner, it has an x component and it has a y component. That is to say that a bit of the force is pulling up and a bit of the force is pulling along. And the way we've resolved, and that's the correct mathematical term, we've resolved this 10 newtons into the x and y plane by simply going in the x direction, it'd be 10 through the angle cos 30. And given this is a right angle here, this will be 60 degrees. The y would be 10 through the angle cos 60. And if we wanted to be clever about it, we could also write 10 sine 30. And in some of my other videos, I go through this in more depth. And it is possible to solve this next problem using this method, but it will lead to a number of uh, simultaneous equations which uh, can be a little tricky to deal with. So there's actually a simpler method which I encourage you to use in this situation called the parallelogram rule. So we are going to attempt to apply that method now. So we have a resultant force acting on a gusset plate of uh, 1.45 kilonewtons. Uh, it's acting at 30 degrees. And instead of finding the resultant like we normally have to do and use a bit of Pythagoras uh, to work out the resultant, we're given the resultant and we have to work out this force, this unknown force, P. So let us draw a diagram. We'll continue with our initial method, state variables, diagram, relevant formulae, and then get stuck in. So let's do that. Okay, so 1B. So let's draw a diagram. Uh, we have a point. We have our 300 Newton acting in the positive x we have our uh, resultant oops of 1450 and remember that trick if it's kilonewtons or megapascals or meganewtons or whatever prefix they use write it directly down in standard form or as an integer don't be writing kilonewtons you will get confused when it comes to put it in your calculator. Uh, we also have this angle here, this unknown force P at an unknown angle. So the way the parallelogram rule works, and I will use a different color for this, is you construct a parallelogram uh, and then you use cosine rule to resolve the problem. So in a parallelogram, so-called because there's parallel lines, this P will have an equivalent here. So these two sides here are the same. And similarly, we'll have this 300 Newton element here. These are the same as well. So this is also 300 Newtons. Now what we have is we have some triangles and we have the cosine rule, which we can use. So let us redraw this triangle so that we can use a simple cosine rule um, to, to solve it. So just draw that quickly. So this triangle here represents this particular area. Now I just need to label up the sides. Now we can see that this angle here is 30 degrees. This 
force here, or this side, is 1450. And the other week when we covered this in class, someone asked the question, why can you use a force as a side? Well, forces, by definition, are a vector. They have both direction and magnitude. So in this force triangle, which shows the direction, the magnitude is simply the side length. So we have 300 newtons, or 300 side here, and we've also got an unknown side, P, which is the force. So if we apply cosine rule here, and remember cosine rule is not the Sokotoa business of right angle triangles, that only applies, that's not a right angle triangle, only applies for a triangle with a 90 degree in it. This does not have a 90 degree in it. So we need to use the cosine rule. The cosine rule will be stated on most examination formula sheets, this one included, but it says that an unknown side a squared is equal to b squared plus c squared minus 2bc times cos a. And of course, three rules of bid mass, that's effectively in brackets. What on earth do all these letters represent? Well, you quite often see on a formula sheet various iterations of this where it starts with b squared equals, c squared equals. I recommend you don't bother with that and you just simply call the angle that you know capital A and then proceed in a clockwise manner around. So this is angle B here, angle C, and then opposite angle A is little a, side little a, small a, small letters represent sides, capital letters denote angles. So this is B and this is C. So in order to find this unknown quantity P, it's effectively side little a here. So we can plug in our numbers now. So a squared is equal to b squared, which is in this case 300 squared, plus c squared, 1450 squared, minus 2 times b times c, so 300 times 1450, 300 times 1450, times the cos of a, which is an angle we know, it happens to be 30. And I'm going to plug that into my calculator in one. Um, don't be trying to work this out separately. If you've got a Casio FX 85 GT Plus as the course demands, then that's exactly what this um, this is designed for. So let us plug that in to the calculator and we get the value of a squared to be equal to a big long number um, 1439057.899 that's the value a squared so in order to get a we need to do the square root of that value. Which is equal to P. This thing is the same. P is A in this triangle we've created. And that is equal to 1199.61 Newtons. Which is our size of P. Find the magnitude. So we've found the magnitude. We need to find the direction. So let us um, work out this angle here. This is a thing that we don't know. And rather than use a question mark, what we'll actually do is use the Greek letter theta, as is common for angles. So we're going to redraw this triangle here so that we can find theta. We now know that P is actually equal to 1, 1. 99.61 we've got the 300 we've got the 1450 so what we've got is three sides and an unknown angle so let's i'll carry on in red um let's do this uh, i've got a side there side here and across the top got an unknown angle theta we know that this is one one 
1.99.61. More sensible person might have rounded that to uh, 1,200, but I think 2DP is the standard. Um, we know this side is 1,450, and this side is 300. I'm going to attempt to use the magic of Photoshop just to demonstrate what this thing is. That is just that bit of the triangle there. So we're going to use cosine rule again. On your formula sheet, you will find the version for working at an angle and we'll apply the same method. So we will call the angle we're interested in A, go clockwise around B, C, C becomes little a, this becomes little b, this becomes little c. And when we look at our formula sheet, which really just saves us having to rearrange this thing, um, we'll find that cos a is equal to b squared plus c squared minus a squared, all divided by 2bc. Most the examiners are nice. They don't make you rearrange this, they actually give it you on the formula sheet. So we just need to stick that into our calculator and plug in the value. So in our this case it's 1450 squared plus c squared, which is 1199.61 uh, squared minus a squared, which is 300, all divided by 2 times bc times 1450 times C. Plug that into the calculator and we find out that the cos of A is equal to 0.992. So in order to make that, find out what A is, then we'll just take the inverse cos both sides, that's shift and cos on your calculator. We'll find that A is equal to the inverse cos 0.992. That's how we get A on its own, we do the inverse function. And we will find out that the angle is 7.183. However, it's not asked for the angle to the resultant, which is this. We've just worked out that this is 7.183. Actually, what it's interested in is this angle here which will be 30 at 7.183, which is equal, obviously, to 37.18 degrees to two decimal places, which is part 1b successfully tackled onto 1c. <laughs>
exam speak for u being zero. So let's draw this out. So initially, our speed is zero, our velocity rather. And the way we're going to draw this is a box represents a velocity. So we go down. So it accelerates from rest to its maximum speed of 80 millisecond. We divide it by a thousand if you're not sure how to get into meters, which turns out to be 80 millimeters a second is 0 0.08 meters per second. It carries on for a bit. And it continues at this speed. Okay, so our next bit of the journey is continuing at this speed. 0 0.08. And then it comes to rest. And remember, rest means a speed or a velocity of zero. So we've got all our speeds in there. Let's fill in the other information that we have. We interest in the total time for the journey or the stroke of the planning machine. Goodness knows what a planning machine does exactly. But we've got the time of the first element, the time of the second bit of the stroke, time of the third bit of the stroke, the total time, T1 plus T2 plus T3 is the total time taken for the stroke. So these are our times, these are our speeds. Let's move it to zero. And we're interested in distances. So it accelerates the first bit of the journey is over 8 centimetres or 0 0.08 metres. The second bit of the journey appears to be over 48 centimetres or 0 0.48 metres. And the third bit of the journey, it comes to rest in, in 8 centimetres also. Okay. I hope your exam work will be neater than my graphics tablet work. So what we have here is let's we're trying to work out what T1 is. So for T1, um, we have, well, we don't know what T is. So that's what we're trying to find out. Uh, we're given the initial speed velocity is zero. We wrote it in the box. It's final velocity for this leg is Naught point that's a u, so v is naught point naught eight, and what else are we given? Um, S the distance, which is naught point naught eight. So at this point, you look on your formula sheet to try and find one of the Suva equations that links together all these letters. We're not interested in anything that's got an a in because we're not given a. And it turns out that after reviewing the formula sheet, that will be S equals U plus V T over two. We'll plug our values in. So we'll have 0 0.08, that's S equals U plus V. So naught add 0 0.08 is just 0 0.08 times t, which is the thing we're not sure about, all divided by 2. So let's rearrange to get t. So before I can get at the t, it's being divided by 2, so I'll take that up there. So 2 times 0 0.08 is 0 0.16, which is equal to 0.08t. t has been times by this value, so I'm going to take that under there. So 0 0.0, 0 oops, 0 0.16, take that under there, it's going to equal t, resolve that in your calculator or in your brain, and you'll get t equals 2, 2 seconds for the first stage. Now, I'm going to be quite lazy here, you'll notice it's the same. In fact, you know what, I'm not going to be quite lazy. Don't do that in the exam. I was about to say this is going to be the same calculation because you've got u plus v. It's just v and u the other way around. So the last stage will be two. But let's work it around. Don't take shortcuts like that in the exam. Because if you get it wrong, you'll get no marks for working. 
Right, time two to this section of the journey. So we're interested in the time. We've given the u, in this case is 0 0.08. The V for the second bit, where it ends up, that is 0 0.08. And distance of the displacement for this bit of the stroke is 0 0.48. So it's the same set of variables. We use the same equation. So we will end up with the following 0 0.48 is equal to u plus v, 0 0.8 add 0 0.8, 0 0.08 add 0 0.08, t, the unknown value, divided by um, 2. I'll rearrange again, so 2 times 0 0.48 is going to be 0 0.96 is equal to 0 0.8 add 0 0.8 will be equal to 0.16t. Divide both sides by 0.16. So t is equal to 0 0.96 divided by 0.16, which comes out as 6. 6 seconds. I did that a slightly different way than I did in the first place. If you're not sure on that, then just revisit that first section of the video. You should be able to rearrange that um, quite easily by the time of the exam. So the final bit, now my prediction was it be t equals 2. Let's just run through it. The third section, we're interested in the time. We're given u, is, so it starts off at 0 0.08. Um, oops. It ends up at 0 because it's come to rest. And it does this over a distance of 0 0.08, 8 centimetres. Plug that into our formula. So... S, so 0 0.08 is equal to, and I'm plugging this into this formula, remember, u plus v, so it's 0 0.08, add 0, times t, over 2. Can we see that this will resolve to 0 0.08? That's the same as that. And this section here is this. It's the same thing because it's the same speed up and slow down, uh, same constant acceleration. Anyway, we resolve that as equal to two. We could do it manually again. So the total time for the journey will be two plus two, four plus six, ten. The total stroke time for the planning machine is 10 seconds whether that is fast or slow for a planning machine i have no idea on to question 1d right the final part of this beast of a question is 1d almost four totally discrete topics in one question that is nasty let's crack on we have a girder being pulled along a horizontal floor by a rope at 45 degrees to and above the floor. If the pull in the rope is 1.5 kilonewtons, calculate the coefficient of friction between the girder and the floor. So it's a friction question. Straight away, my brain says F equals mu R. And more to the point, your formula sheet says F equals mu R. We're trying to going to be working out, calculate the coefficient of friction. So we want to know what mu is. So we need to complete our diagram. So I've got my ground plane in here. And rather than draw a girder, and the free body diagram says that we just draw a particle. And we can apply some forces to that. Now, this thing is 250 kilograms. Well, Kilograms is not a force, it's a mass. And we know that force is equal to mass times acceleration. Acceleration on Earth is 9.81. So the force of this thing will be 250 times 
Now, I haven't always explained that in the past. I've just sometimes said that if you want to convert kilograms to newtons, you times it by 9.81. Well, actually, it's because of this Newton's second law. That's why you do it. Um, and gravity on Earth is an acceleration, 9.81 meters per second squared. So that, when calculated, is equal to 2,400... And 52.5 newtons. Okay, so the force exerted by this girder on the ground plane, there we go, is um, two. Very strange one. Trackpad's not working. There we go. Um, two, four, five, two point five newtons. So normally, if this wasn't being pulled by a rope, then let's do a better job than that. The reaction force would simply be equal to this. However, it's going to be slightly different because our girder is being pulled by a rope at an angle of 45 degrees. Which means when this is resolved, as I explained at the very start of uh, question 1b, I think, there'd be an x and a y component. So r is likely to be... Um, it's going to be different because it's going to be have the effect of the, the rope um, pulling on it. So the other thing to note is that when we pull on this rope, the girder will naturally go in this direction. Friction opposes motion. So there's going to be our friction force here. And denote that with F R. So we don't confuse it with force. So that's our frictional force. So at the point of movement, um, we'll call this TR for tractive force. At the point of movement, the tractive force will equal the frictional force. So if we just resolve tractive force down so it's level with this, we'll have the frictional force. So Frictional force is going to be tractive force. Are we given that? Oops, so. Ah, 1,500 newtons. It'd be 1,500 cos 45. Plug that into our calculator, we find out our friction force is. 1060.66 newtons. When I asked for that, we're asked to find mu. So we have our friction. This is unknown. We need to find our reaction force next. So then, reaction force. Well, we know that that is going to be equal to 2452 minus whatever the, the y component of this force is. Let's do that. So effectively it's being pulled up a little bit as well as being pulled along. So for r, it's going to be equal to 2452 minus, so that's 45, that's 45 as well, 1500 cos 45. Plug that into the calculator and we find that R is equal to 1391.84 newtons. We have almost all the information. So we're going to use friction equals mu R. We know our friction is 1060.66. Mu is our Unknown quantity R is 1391.84. So 
So let's get mu on its own. Times both sides by that. I'm going to do it literally this time. Move that under there. There you go. I like that technique. Can't do it in an exam though. Divide that up. And we will get a value of mu equal to 0 0.76, which seems sensible. Mu is seldom greater than 1, and if you've got a mu value of 1,000, then you are certainly wrong. Um, mu is 99% of the time less than 1, and a greater than 0 for that matter. So there we have the monster that was question 1, and it's four separate topics.